But really meditation is about deep listening. Yes. That you sit and then what needs to be understood will come if you sit quietly. It's like going into the forest and finding a little clearing and sitting down. Mm. And if you're quiet for a while, the the animals, the birds, the creatures, they will all resume their life and you see all these things you would never see before. Welcome to the Jack Cornfield Heart Wisdom Hour. We are delighted to share with you Jack's innate common sense wisdom and his clear open heart. If you are interested in supporting Jack's podcast, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Jack. Hello, this is Ganesh Braymiller. Jack Cornfield's media manager and content specialist. I wanted to introduce myself, set the stage for this wonderful episode of Heart Wisdom, and touch base on some amazing new offerings Jack has coming down the digital spiritual pipeline. Firstly, I'd like to welcome you into two of Jack's new online courses. We just finished compiling an illuminating course entitled Buddha Nature, a shining light on how we can apply and live from Buddha's 10 paramitas, or the 10 perfections, in our modern world. We also have a fresh course diving deeply into Buddhist psychology, essential skills for transforming the heart and mind. Find courses like these, as well as guided meditations, teaching articles, and more, over on the new jackcornfield.com. And onto the juice of the podcast. This episode 182 of Heart Wisdom is graciously sourced from Sarah Grinberg's Life of Greatness podcast and features a flowing interview between Sarah and Jack, which spires into conversation on what it was like for Jack to grow up within Judaism, what Jack learned from his teacher Ajahn Shah about being ready for suffering, working with surrender within meditation, the catharsis of emotional release, the true importance of deep listening, Buddhism, as a practice versus a religion, and the psychology of heart and mind. So Sarah Grinberg is a well-renowned interviewer, well-being expert, keynote speaker, and host and producer of the highly rated lifestyle and internationally successful podcast, A Life of Greatness, where she engages some of the world's biggest names. Through her years of research, studying the links between the facets of human behavior, personal growth, and happiness, Sarah formulated her own blueprint for cultivating greatness. This powerful blueprint has become the touchstone of Sarah's courses, talks, and writings. You can keep up with Sarah on Instagram or on her website, sarahgrinberg.com. And here Jack sits down with Sarah for a heartfelt conversation on the end of suffering, digging into topics like attachment, forgiveness, stillness, awareness, inner joy, peace, and presence. And just in some closing comments, it was really nice touching in with you all. Over the next little while, I look forward to jamming on some fun new ways to keep the podcast fresh and get the whole community involved. Again, my name is Ganesh Braymiller, Jack Cornfield's media manager and content specialist, and I truly cannot wait to show you the offerings we have coming. But for now, let's be here now and enjoy episode 182 of Heart Wisdom with Jack Cornfield and Sarah Grinberg, A Life of Greatness. May you all be safe, happy, healthy, and free. Utmost blessings. Enjoy the episode. Jack Cornfield is one of the greatest living Buddhist teachers of our time, introducing Buddhist mindfulness practice to the West. Jack explores the art of stillness and shares what he and others are learning about the space between thoughts. In this heartfelt conversation, we discuss attachment and how it can lead us to suffering, the power of forgiveness, and finding peace and harmony in the everyday. It's like the two ex-prisoners of war that met. They'd been tortured and beaten and all these terrible things. 25 years later, the one says to the other, have you forgiven your captors yet? And the second one said, no, never. And the first one said, well, they still have you in prison then, don't they? It means not carrying the burden of hatred from the past. I'm Sarah Grimberg, and this is A Life of Greatness. 
Through my years of studying and researching the connection between human behaviour, personal growth and transformation, I have discovered the keys to unlocking greatness within others. In this podcast, I share stories and experiences from my own teachings, along with conversations with inspiring guests to help you learn the simple tips, habits, practices and strategies to cultivate an extraordinary existence. Jack Cornfield is the author of many books, including A Path with Heart, After the Ecstasy, the Laundry, and The Wise Heart, A Guide to the Universal Teachings of Buddhist Psychology. Jack Cornfield is someone I have wanted on the podcast from day one. His teachings and wisdom have changed my life in the most profound way, and it was an honour to be with him in conversation and share that with you all today. My hope is that this conversation ignites the inner joy you seek most and guides you towards peace. Jack Cornfield, I've had the honour of interviewing former prime ministers, celebrities, sporting greats, but today is a very special day because you are with me, someone whose work I have admired for many years, and I am very grateful that you're here. So, Firstly, let's start at the beginning. You are one of the West's greatest Buddhist teachers, but you were raised Jewish. Can you tell us a bit about that? Sure. But modern Reform Judaism, which is what I was raised in, is much more focused on goodness and social justice and very little about religion itself. Yes. So I got these beautiful values But in fact, there was nothing about the inner life. And then I went to university. I went to a good Ivy League university and I learned mathematics and history and organic chemistry and, you know, literature and all kinds of things. Nobody told me, what do you do with fears and anxieties of life? Or how do I deal with the violence that was there in my family? Because my father was quite violent as a wife batterer and, a, you know, a tyrant and paranoid. What do I do with that? What do I do with grief? How do I make a relationship? That wasn't part of the curriculum. Yes. <laughs> so I became very interested some way partway through the university. There was this fabulous professor who came up to Dartmouth from Harvard, partly helping start a department in Asian studies. Dr. Wing Sit Chan. And when he started to offer teachings from the Tao and from Buddhist teachings, he said, well, there's in the Buddhist teachings, it says there's suffering in life. Okay, I nodded, got that one. And there's a path to the end of it. And I sat up in my chair and said, oh, <laughs> let me learn more. And I got very much entranced with that. Now, mind you, it was the 60s. Mm. So there was that other little LSD thing happening and other Eastern kind of tendrils of meditation and so forth. So then I went to Southeast Asia, to, to rural Thailand, the border of Laos and Cambodia to work on rural health, kind of rural health teams and uh, tropical medicine for a couple of years as a volunteer and then became a Buddhist monk. And that's where I learned the things that I needed to that weren't there, whether it was Reform Judaism or, you know, good university education. Those are like, they were missing this whole dimension of the heart and connection and emotion and how we live wisely. And I think we all want that. We all need that. Absolutely. I agree with you. How was it becoming a Buddhist monk and how come you went to Thailand? I went to Thailand because I asked them to send me to a Buddhist country. I'd already been studying. Yes. And so it was going to be Thailand or Nepal. And I said, send me the most remote place you can. You know, you're young people. You say, is there anything dangerous to do around here? What can I do? You know, and then the monastery I went into was a particularly austere one in the tradition of the forest monastery. Um, And I remember one of the first things my teacher, Ajahn Chah, said to me when I came in, he said, you know, you're welcome, but I hope you're not afraid to suffer. Now, I thought, now that's a pretty bizarre greeting from somebody. And then he smiled. He was actually very funny and sort of, and he said, you see, there's two kinds of suffering, the kind you run away from, and that follows you everywhere, and the kind that you willingly face. Mm. And that gets transmuted into a whole 
life of freedom for you. Mm. If you're interested in that, come come in the gates or something like that. So there we were in this pretty remote place in the forest. And I started the curriculum of sitting quietly in meditation and being part of a community with a lot of surrender and all this stuff came up. I was sitting and I'd been a peacemaker in my family because my father was so violent and I had three brothers. We all managed it in our own way, but I knew I was never going to be angry like my father. We don't want to be mm. how it is with one's parents. Yes. But I started to sit in meditation and I got more and more irritated by the monks around me and things. I went to talk to the teacher. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to have all this anger arise, which surprised me. Ha ha. Surprised me. It was all stuffed down. That's why I was there. So I said, and I said, what do I do with it? He said, oh, good. I said, what do you mean good? He said, listen, if you're going to be angry, do it right. Go back to your little hut, which has a tin roof. It's the hot season. Close the window and the door. Wrap yourself on all your robes so it's nice and hot. And if you're going to be angry, be angry. Let the feelings come. Let the images learn about its energy. Learn about this and become the witness to it. Become the one who knows, who knows joy and sorrow and gain and loss. Find that place that's centered and spacious that can allow the most intense emotions to come and go and you sit like the like the buddha something mm. like that so that's part of the training it's so interesting isn't it going into that quiet space of meditation and when you say that about letting emotions come up i've meditated for many years and i've cried so many tears in my meditation and i remember things that i thought jack that i didn't even care about anymore that come up and next minute I'm weeping and I'm weeping and almost like a child and then it just passes. It passes and you feel this weight off your shoulders and it is such a sacred space and a place where even though, you know, you are confronted with these certain emotions, it can be a really cathartic way of of moving through them. Yeah, it's beautiful what you're saying. People often have a limited view of meditation that it's supposed to get you quiet or that you're going to stop thinking or there'll be, and there is moments of silence, but really meditation is about deep listening. Yes. That you sit and then what needs to be understood will come if you sit quietly. It's like going into the forest and finding a little clearing and sitting down. Mm. And if you're quiet for a while, the, the animals, the birds, the creatures, they will all resume their life. And you see all these things you would never see before. Yes. And just as you did, you sat down and things started to arise. And then the point isn't even to clear them out, but to become the loving awareness, the loving witness of it and say, oh, this is what makes up my life. And can I be in relationship to all of this from a place of love, from a place mm. of graciousness and, and wisdom? And as you do that, you learn this whole other capacity. Um, I, I read you a, a, a little passage that was written by a meditator friend who died of ovarian cancer. And she said, she wrote, my days are short. And as I grow weaker, I experience so much gratitude for my meditation not only the joy and ease it brought, but the hard parts. Mm. For every bored and restless sitting and every fearful cancer fantasy and every pain and ache I sat through and every itch I didn't scratch was a training for kindness, a training for the muscle for loving awareness, bearing witness, a training for the spirit that carries me now even as I face my death. Oh. That's so beautiful. When we learn to be present for ourselves, um, it gives us the capacity to love others in a deeper way because we're not scared of their grief or their anger or their desire or their longing, all the things that, that make us human. You're obviously such a big Buddhist teacher now. And I've heard you say that Buddhism isn't actually a religion as such. It's more a practice. Can you talk to us about that? For sure. First, the idea isn't to become a Buddhist. Yeah. Spare your friends and family. You don't have to convert to anything or <laughs> convert anybody else. Thank you. The idea is to become a Buddha, 
and yes. not a Buddhist. And so the original teachings, if you look back, are really a psychology of heart and mind. They're, they're the discoveries that the Buddha found. This brings well-being. This brings freedom. This brings joy into life. Here, let me share with you so you learn to do this. Then, like everything, it got turned into a religion. But underneath it, the deep ah, gifts of who we really are, of remembering what matters to us, those are at the core and the possibility that in this human life with its, you know, 10,000 joys and sorrows, it's possible to have a free and wise and joyful heart amidst it all. And you see it, there's a book called The Book of Joy that was published a few years ago, a dialogue between uh, the Dalai Lama and Archbishop Tutu, mm -hmm. both of whom have lived through tremendous upheaval and suffering, the Dalai Lama losing Tibet really, when it was invaded by the Chinese army and, and monasteries destroyed and all of those things and, and Tutu living through apartheid and all of the violence, they laugh a lot in this dialogue and they're so joyful. The Dalai Lama says at one point, so much has been taken from me. Mm. Our sacred scriptures were burned, our monasteries were destroyed, um, much of our culture has been taken. Why should I let them take my happiness? Mm. And there's this sense that we as human beings, the last or the greatest freedom we have is the freedom of our own spirit in the midst of the circumstance of life. And to be able to hold it in compassion and love and feel that, mm -hmm. um, that's, the, that's the real invitation of meditation, of, of one's practice, if you will. You talk about suffering and... The Buddha said that life does have suffering in it, and we all know that. And I wonder for you as being such a, a wonderful teacher of this, how do you move through pain and, and suffering that you've had in your life? Because I know that you have had your fair share of it as well. First, I've suffered it. <laughs> I just thought that myself, which we all do. Yes. At some point you just have to say, okay, this is part of what I got to deal with. So... And that means that if it's difficult and my daughter is in great distress, I will feel fear and anxiety and I don't try to shut it down and say, oh, yeah, it's all going to be fine. It may be fine. A part of me knows that so deeply that things will work out and because that's the nature of life. Earth is giving birth to itself every moment. And there's so much of life that's trustworthy but when it's scary for someone I love, for example, uh, I'll feel the fear, I'll grieve, or some loss and so forth. I go through that or something that's terribly hurtful or upsetting. I feel that. And I've learned somehow to allow all of that, like the poem that I read from the woman at the end of her life, to allow that and to allow it somehow to be held in a much bigger field of loving awareness. Mm. And it's taken some practice. When I get lost, sometimes I flunk the course once in a while, and that's kind of just how it works. But you learn to do this. And, and then as you practice, you can become more gracious and easier and take things a lot less personally. Yes. You say that we always, every day is a day to start over again. We have the ability to start anew. We do. Every day is your birthday. Yeah. The universe starts again at breakfast or whatever. It does because that's a day that no matter what's happened, you still can create with your intention and your thoughts and your actions. You plant the seeds for what the future will be. Yes. And in the heart and mind, there are all these seeds. There are seeds of anger and depression and despair and, and resentment and so forth, fear, and there's also seeds of joy and inner balance and caring and compassion and love. And depending what seeds you water, depending what seeds you attend to and honor, those seeds will grow. Mm -hmm. So if you turn from the seeds of frustration, you can acknowledge them, the seeds of fear. Yes, you acknowledge them. You hold them with kindness. So already now you're watering the seed of 
self-compassion or kindness. This is hard. And then you water the seeds of peacefulness and Mm. balance or equanimity. That grows in you. And we are like a musical instrument. We can tune to all these different levels and chords. Why not tune to beauty? Yes. And I remember even being in, you know, refugee camps and so forth. They weren't very interested in having people come in who were depressed or angry or frightened. They had enough of that. To to go in and be there and see the creativity and beauty still there within people Mm. was amazing. Now, it's also true. I don't want to make this light-sided at all because with the level of racism and climate change and divisiveness and and all of these things that we know are problems in our world, they affect us, some of us very immediately and personally. And it's not like you can just smile and say, oh, I'm peaceful and happy. My, my dear heart friend and teacher and colleague, we spent quite a bit of time together in the monastery, was Mahagosananda, a Cambodian monk who was nominated for the Nobel Prize a number of times, Peace Prize. And when the Khmer Rouge genocide happened, where almost a third of the Cambodian population was killed, he was in the monastery with me in the forest of Thailand, and then was able to go and open temples along the Thai border for refugees who were running away from the Khmer Rouge. And I remember the first temple in this camp, 50 or 100,000 people in these little huts who'd fled with nothing. And he asked if he could speak to them. And the UN running the camp said, yes, he made a little platform and put a Buddha on it. But what can he say? All 19 members of his family had been killed. Mm -hmm. His village and temple was destroyed. And he sat up there and gazed out at this group of people who came, thousands of people who hadn't heard the chants for such a long time. And you could see the shock and the trauma in their faces. It'd be an uncle and his two remaining nephews or a grandmother and one grandchild who'd survived. And he put his hands together and he began to chant in Khmer, Cambodian and Sanskrit, this beginning verse from Buddhist teachings, hatred never ceases by hatred, but by love alone is healed. This is the ancient and eternal law. And he started to chant it over and over again. And as they listened to hear the chants that had been forbidden under the Khmer Rouge, and then the meaning of it, that whatever you've suffered, it doesn't end by hatred. People just began to weep across these you know, 20,000, 25,000 people because he was speaking a truth that was even bigger than their suffering. Mm. And for 15 years after, he led peace walks to back to bring people back to their villages, chanting that chant, hatred never ends with hatred, so they could reclaim with their feet the land that was taken from them. So you start to sense that we human beings have incredible possibilities within us, mm. And to quiet the mind and open the heart and meditation is one of the things that supports that because then you start to remember what really matters to you. Yes. And you get in touch with that kind of inner strength and, and commitment. Talking about, obviously, in a sense, forgiveness, that can be very hard for a lot of people. And I know that it also can be really gratifying once it's done and it's like a weight that that lifts off you but I wonder even for you you mentioned at the start of this recording about your dad and how he was a violent man how did you get into your heart to be able to forgive him that came to me as a process in the monastery working with the practice of forgiveness one of the things that helps with forgiveness and it really helps with compassion for ourselves, because a lot of us have trouble with compassion for ourselves or for others is to see that person as a child. Yes. And when I could visualize my father as a child and 
he had a really rough upbringing himself and he had mental problems. He was a brilliant scientist and did all kinds of creative things, but he had real mental problems. But when I could see him as that, that began to shift. Mm. There's really important things about forgiveness as a practice. It's a beautiful practice. And I've written a little book about it called The Art of Forgiveness, Loving Kindness and Peace. First of all, forgiveness doesn't mean that you forgive and forget. Mm -hmm. It's not like kind of suppressing it all. In fact, you actually uplift, you can let yourself see it and feel what happened and then say, I'll do everything I can to prevent this suffering from happening again. Mm -hmm. So you stand up for what matters when you look at it clearly and say, I, I will do everything. I'll stand in the way of anyone else being harmed or myself. So it's not, it's not a passive thing. It says in the Bhagavad Gita, if you want to see the heroic, look to those who can forgive. If you want to see the brave, look to those who can extend love after hatred. Mm. Actually, forgiveness takes a lot of courage of heart. And then it's not really about forgiving the other person very much, quite honestly. And they may or may not know it or care. Who is it for, really? It's for you. Mm. It's like the two ex-prisoners of war that met. They'd been tortured and beaten and all these terrible things. And 25 years later, and one says to the other, have you forgiven your captors yet? And the second one said, no, never. And the first one said, well, they still have you in prison then, don't they? Mm. Because it's actually what we carry inside that forgiveness is to touch it means not carrying the burden of hatred from the past to, to let go of that. And it doesn't happen quickly. If you do a forgiveness practice, you do it slowly and gently for yourself, for others. And there's beautiful practices and recitations. And maybe you do it, you know, once a day for the next six months or so, right? 150 times. <laughs> And sometimes you say, I hate them, I'll never. Then you start to feel, what is it like to feel that inside? Yeah. Do I still have to carry that? Or can I acknowledge that that's their suffering and I will not let them colonize my heart? Mm. I will live with care and joy anyway. And so it's a beautiful and deep practice. And it, it liberates. Yes, it liberates, absolutely. I've heard you say that grasping is the cause of suffering. Obviously, that's something that the Buddha teaches as well. Can we talk about that? Because that can be hard. It's the idea of non-attachment and not becoming overly attached to things because when we do, we get disappointed and suffering occurs if it doesn't work out the way that we hope it will, which, I mean, <laughs> that's just a daily thing in life. We can't have everything our way, but... I'd love to know what is the best way to move past that so we don't live in that state of suffering. Mm. Beautiful and a deep question. People get confused a little when they hear about non-attachment as if it means being detached so you don't care. Yes. And it actually doesn't mean that at all. There's a short poem by Mary Oliver where she writes... To live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your life depends on it. And when the time comes to let it go, mm. to let it go. And so she's talking about the two sides of what this means, which is to actually be willing to love, to have the courage to care and to love. But as you said so wisely, to also realize that you can't hold on to it. And, you know, if you love a, a person, the love is really to love them as they are. Yeah. <laughs> when I do wedding ceremonies, one of the things that I've done in the past is if you go buy a car to use car lot, there's a sign in the window of the car often that says as is right? So you don't have some expectation. Okay. They fixed everything. You're buying it. So I just say, okay, look at him, look at her. Do you take this person as is? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> because if you don't, then you have all these ideas about how to fix them and how they're doing all that stuff. And you know, yeah, it makes relationship painful and messy. But if on the other hand, 
the answer is not to be attached to the way it's supposed to be, but to love them mm. and to love yourself, to care for both. That's an entirely different way of being in presence. So not being attached, T.S. Eliot, the great poet said, teach us to care and not to care. Yes. Teach us to sit still even among these rocks. So there's this beautiful human paradox that we love, but we can also love lightly. We can love deeply and care and also realize that it's ephemeral. Mm. It will change. The great Zen poet Isa wrote these th three or four lines. He said, dew evaporates and all this world is dew. So fair, so refreshing, so fleeting. Now listen to it again one more time when I explain. He wrote it right after the death of his young daughter. Mm. Dew evaporates and all this world is dew. So dear, so refreshing, so fleeting. Mm. And so it has all that deep love and also that understanding that this is a dance and we become the loving witness of it. And that's the game, really. And you talk about starting over again. That's our assignment each day. Maybe you wake up and you have your breakfast and you say, what would love have me do today? Mm. Someone said to me the other day, try living a day and looking through it as Jesus would look through his eyes at everyone. And I just thought that's so beautiful. What would you do in a day if everyone you encountered, you looked through as if you were the eyes of Jesus? And it's kind of similar to what you're saying. It really changes your interactions. And you mentioned something like everyone is a guide from above. I've heard you say that before. Yeah. So here's a little poem Again, a short one from Juan Ramon Jimenez called Yo No So Yo, I Am Not I. I am not I. I am this one walking beside me whom I do not see, whom at times I manage to visit and whom at other times I forget. The one who remains silent when I talk. The one who forgives sweetly when I hate the one who walks outdoors when I am inside, the one who will remain standing when I die. Mm. And it's as if we get caught in our small self-identity, having to get things done, reacting, and so forth. And we, we sort of forget the big picture that you're talking about, which is mystery. Yeah, We all know it. You know whether it was walking in the high mountains or making love or being there at the birth of a child or the witnessing the death of someone and holding their hand. And all of a sudden that silent, like a falling star, that moment when spirit leaves the body mm. and it's just a body and it's not that person they were anymore, you know, or that moment hearing that magnificent piece of music or being out, you know, and then you realize, oh, this is what it's about. Mm. You know, who I am is actually who you are, is consciousness born into this body. It's not, you're not the body and you're certainly not your emotions and thoughts, I hope. I mean, you use them. It's lovely to have yes. them. But that you are the consciousness that's born into this body. Mm. You are the loving awareness itself. And you get to have this incredible human ride, mm. this great journey. And then, as you say, you can take it. You can take it all as as teachings, as things that help you to yes. fulfill your love. You touched on loss before and grief. And I think, you know, I even know talking about this, I understand it and understand my belief is that the soul continues but still, when you go through it, it's so hard and it can be so challenging. And I think not only is it something that we all have to encounter in our lives, no one is immune to death or to, to going through grief. How do we do that in a way that doesn't break us and consume us for the rest of our lives? 
Well, a few things, because it's such a deep question. First, there's no right way to grieve. Mm. We live in modern societies that have forgotten how to grieve pretty well. And for some, it will be wailing. And for some, it will be making a piece of art or listening to music or spending, you know, the next year mostly private and quiet if it's something that the grief is so deep. And people say, aren't you over it yet? You're over it when you're over it. Mm. And you... You grieve and then you start to feel like it wanes and then you're out in the supermarket trying to figure out which kind of pasta to buy, the long ones or the little <laughs> run, or which kind of soap to buy. And, and you've forgotten and then a huge wave of grief washes over you in the aisle of the market and you realize, oh, it's here again. And it comes, it doesn't go away. It will come back in its own waves because it wants to be felt and honored mm. and danced or moved or wept or spoken or story told. And so we each have to find our, our way. There isn't a, a right way to do it. And the, the amount of grief really is equal to the amount of love. Mm. You grieve because you love that much. Yes. So, so that's the first thing. And recognizing and, and, and valuing it. And a lot of times we need to tell the story. Not always, sometimes we don't, but um, I remember I was working with these wonderful men who I've worked with for decades. Uh, Michael Mead, a mythologist and great teacher. Luis Rodriguez, who was the poet laureate of Los Angeles and a Chicano activist and amazing folks. And we were leading a retreat for young men coming out of street gangs in L.A. Mm -hmm. and Oakland and so forth. And we're sitting up there and they're leaning back with their hoods up and, OK, man, you're going to read us some poetry. And, <laughs> you know, you got some meditation or some shit like that. <laughs> yes. Give me something better. We're out on the street. People got nine millimeters. I got these. Yeah. What, what do you got? And so we took a candle and lit it and put it on a just a plain wooden table and said, we can't even start this conversation because there are too many people with us in this room who haven't been acknowledged yet. Would you go outside in the parking lot and pick up a stone for every young person you know who's been killed? And when you put it on the table, say their name. Mm. And some of these kids would come back with their hands full of stones and say, this is for Tito, and this is for RJ, and this is for Homegirl, and this is for Raven. And when we sat back down, the hoods came off, and the eyes opened. It's like, oh, okay, we can get real here. We can get real here. Because it needs to be held and acknowledged by others who are unafraid to mm -hmm. say, all right, this is what, where we are. And with that, you learn the capacity of the heart to hold it all, to see it and say, yes, this is the measure of sorrows we've been given. And like the mother of the world, they say, we each are given a certain cosmic measure of tears and sorrow and are called upon to hold it with one another mm. in tenderness and in compassion and understanding. And then as you do, this other magic thing happens, which is you realize that you're not alone, yes. that you're not the only one grieving. You're not the only person who's lost a parent or lost a child or, or whatever, but it's actually, it's us. And that's how it's supposed to be in some very, very deep way. And even meditation, when you're really grieving, often you can't sit in meditation or you sit, but it just feels like it doesn't work. Yes. But yet, you just stop and you let yourself be. Mm. Maybe you dance, maybe you walk in the woods, whatever, and you sit quietly, not in order to get somewhere or fix something, but just in order to hold it all yeah. with that place of wisdom and love. I've seen a lot of people when they go through grief, and especially maybe a loss of a child or something that is really quite traumatic and there's a big anger that comes and it almost is that they lose their faith. They lose their faith yes. that anyone, yes. if there was a divine presence, how could this be done to them? Yes. How would yes. people move through that? 
Well, again, the first thing is to say, of course that will come. Yeah. Anger will come, rage, betrayal, bitterness, raging at God. How could this be? If it's suicide, it's even more complicated. Yes. What could I have done? What regret? All of that. I was teaching one evening in San Francisco with this Canadian Tibetan non Pema Chodron, who's yes. a wonderful teacher. And we had two or 3,000 people in an audience on compassion we were teaching. And a woman stood up partway through with such raw emotion because her partner had just taken his own life. And so she was distraught with all this. How could it be? And he was a meditator. How could he do that? Didn't, it didn't work. And how, you know, how could God let in every, you know, yes. ter tremendous grief and confusion? And fear and Pema kind of circled her with her words and her energy of compassion say let's hold all this it's it hurts so much let's just hold this with compassion so we were breathing and then I could feel how alone she was so I said how many other people in this room have lost someone in your family or very close to you from suicide would you stand up or raise your hand I don't know, maybe 200 people. Wow. Because it's not 15%, 20%. And then I said to this woman, I said, please keep your eyes open and look at all these people who stood up. And I asked those of you who stood up, would you please look at her? Just gaze at her and let her know that you understand. And I tell you that civic auditorium in the center of San Francisco turned into a holy place. Yes. There was so much tenderness and understanding without any words of what they had all shared and what it means to survive this and live and love anyway. It's so true. And the power of compassion, it's so, it's so unbelievable. It's so beautiful. I remember I was at a retreat and we were doing healings on people that were unwell and we stood in a circle and we did not know the other people that were in the healing circle with me. And you didn't know what was wrong with the person who was lying in the middle. And we just, all we needed to do is give them unconditional love. It was so beautiful, not only for the person being healed, but you as the healee, the love that you then access from something like that is just there's barely words to describe the feeling and, and something. I couldn't stop crying. It was hilarious. I just could not stop crying because it was so beautiful. It was something that I'll absolutely never forget. So thank you for telling that because I can feel it from you as you say it. And then you raised the question before, why not remember that every morning at breakfast? Yes. And see everybody, see the secret beauty of everybody that you pass through those eyes, because you have it in you. That's the cool thing. Yes. It is who you are. It's our true nature. And so in a way, meditation is just a little window, a reminder to say, hey, why not live who you really are? Yes. And then you see all the resistance, but that's okay. Yes. You love that too. And the point isn't to get rid of your personality. You're born with a body of a certain shape and size, more or less, and you're born with a personality and they're all weird. Yeah. That we are all, not just them, we. So then you adopt it and you say, all right, but it's my personality, like you're adopting a pet. I'll be kind and I'll love anyway. I've heard you talk a lot about thoughts and how that almost they're clouds and we should watch them pass by. And I wonder if we could touch on that because sometimes our suffering can come from our own mind and we make up things that aren't even true. We ruminate on things. What are your best ways to yes. move through those irrational thoughts or those thoughts of anxiety of the future or dwelling on the past? How do we best be present and not allow those overwhelming thoughts to occur? Well, there are different things, of course. There are sometimes that 
we just get lost and it's really good to go outside yes. <laughs> and just walk in nature. The trees will teach you. They have their unbroken presence mm. that just like the weather comes and goes in the storms. I mean, they're still there and you can feel that in yourself. All right. The thoughts are coming like wind, like clouds, some of them storm terrible. So getting out in nature, there's another thing that you can do. There's so many things. You can use the power of your loving awareness of the kind of witnessing. If you try to get rid of the thoughts, what happens is that pushing against them gives them more strength. I hate these thoughts. I don't want to be so judgmental. I don't want to be so caught up in this. I don't want to be so anxious. I hate this anxiety. That just magnifies them. It gives them strength and energy in some way because it takes them to be real. The alternative, which is what you can practice, is to turn toward the thoughts and the emotions because they're together. There's the anxiety in the body and then there's all the thoughts that tell you terrible things are going to happen. You remember what Mark Twain said. He said, my life has been filled with terrible misfortunes, most of which never happened. (laughs) Right? Yeah. So you, you see the catastrophizing thoughts and the this and that. And instead of resistance, you say, thank you. You say, thank you for trying to keep me safe, mind. You're so busy thinking and picturing and working it all out because you're trying to keep me safe. Thank you for keeping me safe. I'm okay right now. Thank you. You can relax. And then you turn your attention away from it, not suppressing it and not judging it, but just say, okay, that's a channel. I respect you're trying to help me. Now let me take the next step. Let me take a bite of this delicious soup that's on my plate. Let me turn my gaze to something that I'm working on or, and so forth. And then the thoughts come back and you say, yeah, thank you again. I'm all right. Thank you. I'm actually fine. I appreciate your care. And then you shift the channel. Mm. Something really interesting that happened to me the other day. I knew I was going into a situation that was making me feel anxious. I said to my friend, who's a great teacher, mm. I'm worried about this situation. Well, what should I do? And they're like, just breathe. When you're in there, watch your breath. Breathe in. It was the first time, Jack, where I had gone, and I know so much about the breath, mm. had I actually used it properly. But in this situation that I was feeling really anxious about, I started watching my breath, counting in, holding, <laughs> breathing out. My anxiety and panic was, it just absolutely squashed it. It was unbelievable how good I felt when I was so nervous before that and how that situation never got to be a panic attack or anything like that because I had used the power of my breath to control myself. And I know that you've done a lot of work with breath and it's just, I mean, it's our life force, but really it showed me what a powerful, powerful tool it is. Yes, it is. Thank you for that story because it'll help people listening. And you don't have to become a great breath expert or have done lots of breath trainings or things. Just what you're saying, to take 10 or say, I'll take 20 breaths. I'll let them be deep. I'll just relax them. I'm not even trying to change things. I'm just going to open up and breathe and see what happens. And things start to settle down and open up just in that very simple way. Or as Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese Zen master would say, with each breath, you add the simple word ease or calm with each breath. And it invites the psyche, the heart and the mind to say, oh, yeah, around all the worry and so forth, there's a space of calm. Yeah. There's a space of ease. That's so beautiful. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. You spoke before about loving awareness, and it is an absolutely beautiful phrase. Can you talk to us about what loving awareness is? Let's do it this way. As you listen to me for the next minute or so, let your eyes close, or if you're driving and listening, don't close your eyes, but tune in inwardly. And first notice the state of your body whether there's tension or ease, relaxation or pain or pleasure. And then you can say to your body, thank you for carrying so much. I'm okay just now, thank you. And you can do the same for your heart and mind. 
After you thank your body, notice what are the feelings and thoughts that are here now. Pleasant or unpleasant stories, emotions, sadness, joy, worry. And you feel them and see them and say, thank you. Thank you, dear heart and mind for keeping me safe, for carrying so much. And now notice that you're not your body. You're paying attention to it. You're not your emotions, the sadness or the joy. You're not those thoughts. You thank them all. Who you are is the one who knows them. Mm. You are actually the awareness itself, the witnessing. And it's not something very complicated. It's what's true all along. Mm. So you just now shifting your attention from believing the thoughts and feeling your body should be a different shape or needs this or that. And instead, stepping back and being the loving witness of it all. Mm -hmm. And then you can respond and say, oh, my body needs to get outside and exercise. I've been sitting here in the studio all day or my heart. Oh, I have so much longing. I want to tell this person I love them and I haven't done it because I got quiet. I remembered. Oh, yeah, that's something I really want to do. So you, you learn from it, but you realize that you can step outside, that you are bigger than that, that you're not caught in all of that. Does that work for you? Does that That's beautiful. Make sense? That's really beautiful. This idea of the witness is interesting and I've heard it being talked about before and how it's almost like you said, we're watching ourselves. Yes. It's almost when people have those out-of-body experiences and they're kind of looking down at themselves, that's when people say witness, that's what I always think about. Can you explain that idea of the witness? Because it is so intriguing. I like the word witnessing even more than making it a verb rather than a noun or something as a process, that it's consciousness. Consciousness was born into our body and we'll leave it. That's the reality. And if you have that honor of being in that mysterious moment with someone when they die and that moment of consciousness leaving, it's so clear that that, that who we are is not the but one of my teachers in India said, you are not made of, you know, rice and chapatis and, you know, uh, soup and whatever it is that you eat. That's just not who you are. Uh, it's not who we are. But there's something that's much deeper than that. And we know it. And we know it in those special moments. Again, we get, we really get reminded of it. What is the best advice that you have ever been given? I've had lots of good advice. The advice that, that makes a difference comes when you feel recognized and respected, mm. seen with love. Somehow there's something about that. Yeah. And then my teacher would say, I, I change it all the time. If you're about to fall off on the left-hand side, I'll say, turn right. You know, <laughs> if you're about to get lost in the right, say, good, turn left. I want you to come back to be where you are, centered and open and loving I, we give ourselves advice. I think the best advice is the ones that you can give to yourself when you get yes. quiet and you remember your deepest intention. Mm. This is something that that is quite central to Buddhist psychology. And at, at its heart, Buddhism is a psychology of mind. It's not a philosophy, but it's a way of living. So what is your deepest intention yes. in this life? What matters to you most? And if you take some time to quiet and reflect, it sets the compass of your heart in a direction. So when you get in difficulty, you pause for a moment. You say, well, what's my, what's my best intention mm. here? I got in conflict with this person or I don't know what decision to make. What's my highest intention? And when you remember it, it guides you. Mm. There's this beautiful poem, a prayer called by Diane Ackerman, wonderful poet. She writes, in the name of daybreak and the eyelids of morning and the wayfaring moon and the night when it departs, I swear I will not dishonor my soul with hatred, but offer myself humbly as a guardian of nature, a healer of misery a messenger of wonder, and an architect of peace. Mm. And of course, that's a very fine poet, 
you might have the simple, deep intention of, I vow to be kind to myself and others. I vow to care, whatever it is. But when you get quiet and you ask, what matters in the end in my life? That becomes then a refuge of support you can turn to whenever there's questions or conflict or things come up. You set your intention. Hmm. I wonder, I'm sure that you have many, but do you have a favorite mantra or prayer? Hmm. I like to do loving kindness meditation Mm. a lot. And there's lots of versions of it on my website, but you know, Sharon Salzberg and Tara Brock and Thich Nhat Hanh and many, many versions and compassion practices too. Yeah, we have these beautiful groups in this community company we founded called Cloud Sangha, where people can join together and do practices like loving kindness and compassion. Cloudsangha.co. Anyway, what I like is if I'm you know, walking down the street or driving or something like that, and someone gets in my way, and I'm somebody is I'm, I'm a little bit of a speed freak by nature. You know, all the, these meditation teachers are all very slow <laughs> and mindful. I'm like somebody who was doing a retreat when they, she said she'd come all the way from Italy to do this long retreat I was teaching in the U.S. And she listened to my voice and it sounded so sweet. She said, and I watch you running around like an Italian shoe salesman. <laughs> that was her comment about me. Anyway. So I'm in a hurry or I'm trying to get things done and then people get in my way and I can notice a little irritation and they're old, they're young, they're too wet or there's all the little judgments. And I love that because the minute it comes up, it sort of triggers this moment of loving kindness and I go, oh, I see them and I see them as a child. Mm. And I say, oh yeah, that old person there. What was it like? What did they look like when they were a kid? How lovable, you know, would they have been? And this other person. So that's, it's not a mantra, although may you be safe and protected. May you be well, may you be held in love. Those are the loving mm-hmm. kindness mantras. But it's just that moment where it feels like I've gotten a little lost in myself. And then I go, oh, yeah, here we are. Let's hold you and all of us as the children that the you know, the child of the spirit in everyone. That's so beautiful. I know that you would have had a lot of mystical experiences, but is there one that you've had that really touched you that you could talk about? When my father was dying, he was 75 and he he was dying of a congestive heart failure. He had a valve replacement, but it only lasted for 10 years at that time. And he was quite paranoid and frightened so he he designed some of the earliest artificial heart and lung machines when he taught in medical school and did space medicine he did all this weird stuff but anyway he kept looking at the monitor to make sure he hadn't died yet but he was terrified and I hung out with him because I'd forgiven him a long time ago he was just who he was he was still my father he got more scared and I said dad what do you think happens when you die And he said, nothing, I'm a scientist. Your body decays, you turn to dirt. And I said, well, that's that's one story. But if you're really a good scientist, you have to keep a little bit of an open mind rather than a presumption. You don't exactly know what is going to happen when you die, do you? He said, well, no, I don't actually know. I said, all right, so let me tell you a few things. He said, first of all, and I described the first out of body experience I had while meditating and I, there I was sitting there and, and I was actually starting to fall asleep. And then I could feel myself looking out the window of this place and seeing all these things happen. And then I turned around and I looked back and there was somebody sitting there and then well, what are they doing in this? Oh, it's me. Oh, I'm not in my body anymore. And I, and then I ended up back in my body and then I walked over to the window and then sure enough, I'd seen exactly what was happening that I couldn't see sitting there. I said, so this happened many times. And then I said, in an accident, so many people leave their body. Here's how that happens. I said, I've done past life regressions for people around the world. And they don't necessarily believe it. I don't care what they believe. We just do it. 
And half the people, many of the non-believers have these amazing experiences of remembering past lives. I said, and then when I've sat with people, done this hospice work, and they come very close to dying, especially if they're still somewhat conscious and they've described, they floated out of their body, but it wasn't quite time yet. And they came back in and they all tell me the same thing. I said, so when you die, you might turn into dirt, but I think more likely you're going to float out of your body. There'll be a sense of light, which everybody describes and which I've experienced. Um, There'll be a huge sense of peace and relief and maybe a looking back like, wow, that was an amazing dance, that incarnation. I said, But you're the scientist, you have to wait and see what happens. But remember, if it does happen, I told you so. (laughs) And what did he say? He smiled. He was still scared, but somehow I think my own, we borrow wisdom from one another. Yes. My own steadiness was the middle of the night. I was tired. I was going to go. He said, please don't go. Please don't go just stay all night. So I did. Hmm. And how was that experience when he passed away? So two nights later, we were staying, my three brothers and my mom, who'd come with me, who fell into the East Coast, and I were staying in the Ben Franklin Hotel in Philadelphia, where my father had been in the ICU at University of Pennsylvania Medical School Hospital. And he'd gone to Penn. I'd gone to sleep, and then I had this dream that the doorbell rang or knock on our door in our suite. And it was my father. And he walked in and I looked at him. I said, dad, oh, I'm glad to see you. But I'm a little surprised because you died a few days ago. (laughs) And he looked at me kind of quizzically. He said, I died? I said, yeah, that's what happened. He looked at me again as I sort of wide, oh, okay. And then he turned around quietly and walked out. Now, you know, it was a dream. Who Mm, knows? I'm not telling anybody to believe anything, but it sure fit for him. (laughs) It was was like, oh, okay, you told me. Now I guess it's actually (laughs) happening. Wow, that's incredible. What is a life of greatness to you? It's very clear to anybody who looks that, no amount of scientific progress and technology, no amount of computers and internet and space technology and biotechnology and nanotechnology and all these things is gonna stop continuing warfare. It's gonna stop continuing racism and divisiveness is gonna stop climate disruption and the kind of things we're concerned about because all those are rooted in the human heart. And so our task as human beings now is to match match that remarkable outer development that we have, where you have the great library of Alexandria and 12 million cat videos all in your phone in your pocket. I mean, amazing technology. We have to match the outer development with the development of heart and consciousness. And that's really our human task at this time, because it's from the heart and mind that those problems arise, but also that's the place where when we get connected with one another in true interconnection and caring and understanding, that's where also the joy and the possibility and the benefit of life uh, arises. And the beautiful thing is we each get to do our part. No one ever in the galaxy has been quite like you. We're all so unique and strange and weird in our own remarkable ways. And you get to add your piece to it. And that is, you get to deliver the cargo that was given to you to bring onto Earth in some beautiful way and add it to the to the whole. Jack Cornfield. You are one of our greatest teachers for a reason. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your time today. I am so unbelievably grateful. It was it was lovely to be in conversation with you. Thank you so kindly. I'm, it was a pleasure to do it, Sarah. <laughs>